Hi everyone, I'm Alex Brooks, the editor of KidSpot, and I'm thrilled to bring you the Voices of 2014 online masterclass. Voices of 2014 is a year-long program that celebrates the best of Australian blogging. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by a bunch of highly influential, knowledgeable and very generous bloggers who are happy to share with you their secrets to blogging success. In this session, you'll learn how to maximise the reach of your blog, pick up some video tips, and perhaps even make money by connecting with brands. While we are all spread across the country, there is a hashtag to unite us all, and we encourage you to upload your thoughts, learnings, or questions to hashtag Voices of 2014. So grab a cup of coffee and a notebook and get set for some amazing insights on making and strengthening your digital brand. Now that the formalities are done, I would love to introduce you to our first speaker, Lexi Kentman, who is a PR manager by day and blogger by night. With over 15 years experience working with the media, she has created her own blog, Potty Mouth Mama, a labour of love that's endured for over six years. Her blog covers anything that captures her attention, life, beauty, fashion, events. She is here today to reveal some tips and techniques on how to build the relationship between bloggers and PR. Blogging has undergone a major evolution in the last six years. It all started as a truly community-based space, all virtual hugs, blog hops and giveaways, but not the giveaways we know now. No, these were op shop finds, handcrafted goodies and handwritten notes. Of course, this all still happens, but since brands have wanted a slice of the blogging action, things have changed. My name is Lexi. I've been a blogger since 2007 and worked in consumer PR for 15 years. Today I'm hoping I can share some tips on how you can work with brands. Whether you've been blogging for three months or three years, if you want to start working with brands, you need to think about your audience. Basically said, brands want to work with bloggers for the third party endorsement, for your voice. Because your audience is valuable and your audience listens to you. Which is why you need to think about which brands you want to work with. If you blog about teenagers, do you want to blog about nappies? I get these requests and husk review opportunities all the time. If you blog about whole food, do you want to blog about cheese sticks? No one knows the answers to these questions except for you. And you need to think about how your audience will respond to your sponsored posts. Make a list of brands you'd love to work with. That's a great starting point. So every day I get approximately a bazillion emails. I spend most of my day reading and replying to emails. If you have an idea of PR being glamorous, then picture this. I am sitting at my desk, reading and replying to emails, fielding so many inquiries and most people want something from me. Boo hoo, poor me. So what am I looking for? It might sound crazy, but I really want a connection. Think about it this way. Would you go up to someone in the street and ask for their business card? Hells no. Same applies to emailing people. I get many emails asking me for things straight up but with no idea formed, even a vague idea. And this applies to PR professionals too. I've told you about my inbox, but what about your inbox? It's probably similar. Increasingly, PRs are jumping on the blog bandwagon and letting you know they think their news is interesting for your audience. But do they really know? The number of times they email back and say, thanks for thinking of me, but it's not quite right, I've lost track of. But don't hold back from saying no. You'll know when something is right for you and your blog. Like anything in life, don't be afraid to say thanks, but no thanks. There's no harm done and the PR might keep you in mind for something that might suit you later down the track if you keep on good terms. I get a lot of bloggers asking to work with freedom. It would make my day really easy to be able to say yes to everyone, but I just don't have the budget, the resources, and sometimes things just don't fit with our brand or our plans. If a PR turns you down, don't be rude. They're just doing their job. I've had bloggers cold calling me expecting the world and when they don't get it, receiving an email saying, too bad, comes across as aggressive. Being completely frank, I'd rather work with someone that's easy to build a rapport with than someone that gets their knickers in a knot. A rude reply will mean you probably won't get another email from me. There's no romancing the fact that blogging about brands changes things. It's all about sales. So you have to be clear that you're benefiting from the relationship too. You don't want to be in bed with every brand that approaches you. You can afford to be choosy. I always think, do I really like this brand? Can I talk about this brand with integrity? Does my audience want to hear about this brand? Make a list of the brands you really love and then go from there. Don't be sad if a brand doesn't want to work with you. It's not personal, not even close. There are budgets to consider, numbers, timing. Does it fit with a new product launch? Does it fit with their brand? You never know what's happening in a marketing team and these days teams are lean and under the pump. 
If you don't get a response, it's because we're literally struggling with our inbox and our voicemail and so much more. I've had the great joy of working on some collaborative pieces with bloggers such as Checks and Spots, The Red Thread, Sunday Collector and Interiors Addict. These have been more creative projects than a dictatorship. We talk about what we're looking for from the collaboration, we talk about some ideas and then the blogger comes back to us with some concepts that, they, that would work for them and for our brand. It's all about a mutually beneficial partnership. If you've got ideas, don't be afraid to pitch them, but make your pitch dead simple. If you overcomplicate things, you lose the audience. Make things quick and simple. Personally, I've chosen to support a few charities that really resonate with me. I donate my money and time to these charities when I can and blog about them too. But as much as I'd love to, I can't support every charity that comes my way. Otherwise, I would have to set up my own charity fund to support me. I've had to take the same approach to blogging. I get a lot of charities requesting posts. I feel terrible that I can't support them all, but I just can't. So I've chosen a few that I want to work with throughout the year and then a couple more come my way and I try to do what I can, but I never charge them. After all, blogging is about community and it's good to be part of the community for more reasons than I can rattle off right now. Pitch your ideas and don't be afraid to proactively contact PRs. Don't be a stalker, try and fail and keep on going. And finally, be brave. Thanks, Lexi. Our next speaker, Tani, left a world of suits and legal jargon nearly seven years ago to openly welcome motherhood. She blogs about the marvellous and mundane of daily life with her smalls at Milk Please Mum. And she is here to reveal some amazing tips on creating video content for your blog. Hi, I'm Tani and I blog at Milk Please Mum. I've been blogging for about two and a half years now, which is a fairly short amount of time in the blogging scheme of things. Uh, I'm a mother and a photographer. Um, I take way too many photos of my children <laughs> uh, every day I, and I turn them into um, short little films which are designed to be uh, time capsules really of uh, our time together as a family growing and as the kids grow uh, and sometimes I make films directly related to my blog or um, perhaps for a sponsored post or uh, I use it in my work for the families who I take photos for um, and I'm here today to talk a little bit about that uh, how you can make great videos for your blog which was actually Pip's words, not mine. <laughs> I love making films. It's a really lovely, different way to tell a story, which is what I love to do, tell stories with my photos, whether it's personally with my family or my children or another family who would like me to tell their story. Um, so there are lots of different ways to do it. Um, you can tell your story purely with still images and putting it together to make a film. You can incorporate video. Um, use your still motion to create stop motion um, and also a big mix of it all together. Um, I've only been shooting films, small films, for not even 12 months. So you can learn very quickly and I guess if you give it anything the time um, and put your passion into it, then you can improve very quickly. Because my blog is... Um, well, has been put into the category of personal and parenting because I really just talk about my life, um, you know, to share with my family who are who don't live close to, to us. Um, the, the films I make fit very easily into that, so I'm able to share them on my blog um, and use them to point um, traffic into the direction of my other blog for work. 
So the thing, you know, both of them sort of work hand in hand. Um, so we don't have a lot of time today. So it will just be tips um, and ideas about getting started if you've never done this before or if you've, you know, had a little go and you're sort of lacking the um, the inspiration to move forward and, and take things to the next level. So let's get started. So today I'm going to be covering um, a handful of things. We're going to get started first. Um, we're going to go equipment, planning and storyboards, possible themes, different formats that you can use, tips and guidelines for shooting and filming, how you should go about collecting your story and then what to do with it once you have your story, programs and music, sharing your work and individuality. Starting anything new is always the hardest part. So once you get moving and you find that bit of momentum you need, you get a kick of inspiration to help keep you going. If you've never made a film before, don't panic. This is designed to help you, not make you run in the other direction. So the first thing you need, if you've never done something like this before, is to be open to a new experience. So don't let your mind tell you that you can't do this, because you really can. The very best of everything began with nothing and patience and practice goes a very, very long way. So let's talk about equipment. I shoot with my DSLR because that's what I'm comfortable with and it's always lying around so I can just grab it. You can use your phone or a video camera um, and you might think seeing creativity there is a strange thing to use for equipment but really I think it's the most important piece of equipment that you can have and use. So for those of you that want to know the ins and outs, I use a Nikon D610 and my 35mm 1.4 lens is pretty much on all the time because it's just such a beautiful lens. Now plenty of the films that I create are put together using um, pieces of, the, of story and information that are just happening in our day to day. But let's for argument's sake say that we're going to create a film that we have shot nothing for yet. So this is where um, a bit of personal preference comes into this, um, whether you are a planner or you're not a planner and you like to kind of just go with, go with however you feel at the time, which is probably more the way I like to do it. I definitely feel my way through things much more than planning step by step, but if you're a very visual person and you need that those tangible pieces of information to follow, like a storyboard, then I'd encourage you to do something along those lines. When you start a project, you may already have an idea of what format you want to use. What do I mean by format? <laughs> well, this is what I mean. Stills, video and stop motion are the three formats that I use and then putting them all together to make a mix sometimes. So you can see here, these images have just been put together back to back to create a film that is purely made up of still images with no transition in between each photo, which is the way that I like to do it. Another option is to use only video footage. So you're piecing it back to back or cutting and pasting, but you are not using any stills, it's only video footage. Thank you. 
Then there's the option of one of my favourite formats, which is stop motion, which is a collection of stills captured in short bursts by the camera and then put together really closely, like 0.1 of a second apart to make it look like an object or a person, uh, whatever you're filming, is actually moving. Super, super fun. Now onto some tips and guidelines for shooting and filming. My golden rule is you can't shoot too much because you can delete all the rubbish later. When you're filming, I'd encourage you to shoot with a manual zoom. Most cameras will have a really horrible, loud in-camera noise, which can be heard on the audio when your camera is trying to focus, and that's something that you can't get rid of. I'd also encourage using a lower aperture in the beginning, say 3.5 or lower, uh, just until you get used to being able to have your lens wide open if that's the way you like to shoot normally. It takes a bit of time to get used to, but before you know it, you're shooting fine. You need to be mindful of your posture and your stance when you're filming to encourage steady hands. I'll talk about that again in a sec in greater detail. Something that you need to check immediately when you start filming something, you need to check what you filmed on your playback to make sure that it's been correctly exposed and you haven't had your hand over the microphone or there's something in shot that you missed while you were recording um, so that you not don't end up filming for 10 minutes and then check it and find that you have to redo it all over again. And something to remember on the really windy days is that you're probably only going to be able to use the visual element because the noise from the wind is just too much, like this. When we're using our camera, we need to remember to use the strap um, because it's going to give you the most stable, um, stable picture. Um, and I pull on it. This is something I learned from my friend Xanthi Berkeley. If you don't know who Xanthi is, Google her and see her brilliance. Um, so you pull on it, basically pull on it, so that your strap is completely taut, like this. So it gives you a much firmer hold on your camera and a much steadier picture. I'm pretty terrible at keeping um, a steady hand. I'm just not naturally stable. I'm trying to be better, but I don't think I'm getting much better. Um, but that's a good trick that I learned from her. Um, sometimes you can't use that. Sometimes you have to have it up here or, you know, purely for the space that you're in or, you know, something is too close. But try and use that as much as you can with your, you know, with your feet spread apart to give you um, a good, you know, centre of gravity to keep things as stable as possible. Another one I learned from Xanthi, if you're using your phone to film a lot, if you prefer that method, which, you know, iPhone does a great job now, there's lots of different apps you can get um, to give you a different look about the films. Um, and something she said that she had learned from another friend was the, the firm hold that you can use on your phone, whatever phone you have. So it's basically, you know, holding it between your, your thumb and your little finger. Um, instead of holding it like this, you know, sometimes you, you're filming like this, it's not really giving you the stability that you need, especially if you, sometimes you have to do it one-handed. So what she recommends is spreading your hands across the back. Um, you know, you're creating more surface covered with your hands to make it as stable as possible. And if you give that a try compared to this, you will find that it, it's immediately more stable. So that's another good one to remember. Part of creating a great film is variety. So we want to use a variety of shots whether you're shooting stills or using film, stop motion, a mix of everything, we want wide, medium and close-up shots. So that means you need to change your position and or your subject's position. So you can see here, this is a close-up and now we've got the subjects moving away from the camera. The camera is still and the subject's coming towards me. I'm moving with my subject, shooting up, shooting down on the ground, Having your subject not appear in the centre of your frame, and the same again here, and not having it in focus all the time. Your subject moving across your frame. Again, just shooting a different angle, lying on the grass there. And here, remembering that every piece that you put into your film does not have to be perfectly shot. Some of the best bits are all over the place. When you're filming or shooting, you are simply collecting images and snippets of information. So 
all you're doing is keeping your eyes wide open and seeing what grabs your attention. Great storyteller will see things that others will miss. So you need to connect with whatever you are shooting. People, animals, places, you need to show a connection there. Um, you also need to remember to include transition pieces. What we're doing is telling a story, whatever, whatever story it is that we're telling, we need those little in-between pieces to take our reader with us or our viewer with us and, and connect the dots to tell a really good story. So you need to think of it as if you're telling a story to a preschooler or a kindergartner. It really is that simple, taking their hand and leading them to the next part of the story. So now it's time to use all the information and footage that you've collected to, to start telling your story. So you need to import all your footage to your computer, whatever programs that you choose to use, review all your pieces and delete all the rubbish. It's be pretty clear what's usable and what's not. Um, seeing what you have collected should give you a really good clear feeling or direction for where you want to go next. Um, so you'll be able to see how many photos did I take? Did I take more photos than footage? Um, it would. This is usually the point where I get a pretty clear idea of where I'm going to take this story. Now onto programs and music. I'm a Mac user, so whatever programs you're using will depend on whether you're a Mac or a PC user. I edit all my photos in Lightroom, all my video footage goes into iPhoto, and then I bring the two together in iMovie. As with most programs like this, it's a simple drag and drop. When you're adding your music to your project, this is a really, really important part of your story. This will set the mood, the pace, the sentiment, the actual feel of your film, so it really needs to be considered. Sometimes I've spent days trying to find the right music, for a film because it just has that much impact. The music you choose for your film should be licensed. This is something that I had no idea about when I first started making films nearly 12 months ago. Um, there are many, many sites that you can use to find your music and buy the licensing. For example, themusicbed.com. Always credit your artist and song, or plural, if you've used a few. Many viewers and readers will go on to purchase the music. I always begin working on my film with the music, so I may have exported all my images and footage and I know what's there to use, but I won't start putting it together until I've chosen the music, purely because I like to use the music in a lot of my films in a very lyrical sense, where the images are being shown in time with the beat of the music and sometimes it happens to fall with the words of the music and they match perfectly with some of the footage that I've taken. So that's the way I like to do it. Some people add it at the end if they're just doing more of a slideshow um, kind of film where the images don't necessarily have to match up with the beat of the music. For me, I absolutely need that music from the get-go because that really dictates how I use the music. And when you're listening to it over and over and over again as you edit, it really becomes a part of you and you can feel the music and really marry the visual and the audio together to make it really special. There are lots of flashy colours and titles and different texts and fonts and formats that you can use. Dependent on what sort of project you're doing, that will determine what you should be using and more importantly what you shouldn't be using. <laughs> We want your content to shine, not have lots of colour and flashiness and weird themes and titles. So whatever you choose, make sure that your font and your formatting is consistent. Once you've decided that your film is ready and finished, I absolutely encourage you to share your work. It will help you improve no end. Seeing your work on a different platform like on your blog or on Vimeo or if you share it on Facebook, you see things that you didn't see as you were preparing the film and piecing it all together in your program on your desktop. Yes, the mistakes and also the really great parts that you know you did really well. And getting feedback from your readers and your viewers will boost your self-esteem because they're going to tell you what a great job you've done. Don't be too hard on yourself on your first few goes because there will be mistakes, but mistakes are a good thing and they help us correct the things that we need to work on the next time round. So a mistake is never a bad thing. I always see them as really, really good things. I share my work directly to Vimeo from iMovie. It's got a really neat little 
um, sharing option there that makes it really simple. I use the Vimeo Plus option, which just gives you more lenience with the amount of footage that you can upload in a certain time frame. And it means that your footage is converted to HD instantly. You don't have to get in a big queue and wait hours for your film to be transferred to HD. They also make it really easy for you to grab the embed code on your films so that you can paste them into your blog in HTML setting. Lastly, I want to talk about individuality. I am a big believer in being the best version of you that you can be. Um, and I believe in putting a little piece of you into every film that you make, which is something that I really try to do. Um, whatever you're creating, you need to connect with it. There has to be some kind of emotional connection to what you're doing. Otherwise, it's not that that feeling is not transferred to your audience or your reader. You need to believe in what you're creating. And the more you create, the more you'll find your own way and it won't feel so hard and you can listen to what your subconscious is trying to tell you and the way that it's directing you. Don't be disheartened by average performances or mediocre creation. We all do them. That's where we all have to start. Uh, and the only thing that's going to change that is practice, practice, practice. And you'll know at the beginning, if you start making films, you'll know whether you really love it or it's just not for you. But I urge everyone to give it a go because it is so much fun and it really is such a lovely, lovely way to create memories or provide information to our readers and our viewers in a little bit of a different way. So, happy filming! Let's not forget we're alive Gonna climb that hill behind my house See what this place is all about Cause from above it all you can't help but say It's gonna be a beautiful day It's gonna be a beautiful day I'm Little boy Don't know yet. Yeah. Sorry, but... Does anyone yeah. Does anyone His name is Baker Julius. Um. <laughs> I knew you should say that. <laughs> what did she say? What is it? Baker. As in bread. Look at him looking at you. Yeah, I just wanted to call you and tell you before yeah, Tani's gonna leave soon and he's good. John Yeah, really not so much the blood afterwards but Yeah, I'm okay. Um, That you say, but let's not forget we're alive. Finally, I'm delighted to bring you a couple of superstars of the digital world. Katrina Chambers and Yanni Constantopoulos. Katrina is a familiar face within the Australian TV and blogging scene. The mother of three found public fame on Channel 9's hit TV series, The Block, back in 2011, and now runs her own blog, Katrina from the Block. Yanni, who joined Ford's social at Ogilvy team after working on Obama's election campaign in Washington, DC, brings over a decade of experience in digital strategy execution, team leadership, and strategic marketing. I spoke with them about how to connect your blog with brands. So Yanni, tell us how brands decide which bloggers they want to reach out to. It's a great question. I think it, it varies from campaign to campaign. 
Uh, and I think the four biggest things that, that brands look for are, are, one, are we reaching the audience that we're trying to get um, in, in working with this blogger? Two, is the content that that blogger is going to produce, does it align really well with the brand's goals, the ambitions, and, and the plan for the campaign? Um, I think thirdly, is, is, it, is it relevant content? And I think fourth, will that content actually have a positive affiliation between the audience and the brand at the conclusion of the program? So it's not about writing product reviews of the brand you want to work with on your blog at all, is it? No, certainly not. And I think that it, it's, it's a matter of creating authentic content that speaks to your audience in an authentic way um, that allows the brand to actually feel that it's engaging your audience in a way that, that, that is relevant and appropriate to that, to that brand. But it's not about a positive review or a quid pro quo. It has to, be feel, it has to feel real. It can't be forced. And you spoke to me earlier about these audits of bloggers and the listening tools you're using to gauge in engagement and reach online. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Yeah, so we use a, a variety of tools to, to, to gauge the extent to which any particular blogger or influencer has what we call good clout across any one of their channels. So whether it's Radian 6 to see overall reach, whether we're using Buzz Numbers or Sysmos, uh, we use Social Bakers to see how well someone's performing on um, Facebook in particular. We use Statagram to see reach over Instagram. Um, there's a whole range of tools at our disposal. Um, and what we look to do more than anything is just to match really well, is this person's reach relevant and, or match very well with their, with their relevance? Um, so are we getting to the right number of people with a message that they're willing to hear? Um, I think that's the most important thing for a blogger to think about. Okay, so Katrina, you've worked with Ford now for over three years. Mm. And in 2011, you were KidSpot's top blogger. Um, and just talk to me about how that relationship with Ford's evolved over time. Yeah, well, I was really lucky, obviously, to get a Ford Territory for 12 months. And um, I had a, a really great relationship with Ford. Um, and since giving the car back, um, I, I maintained that relationship with their PR company. And every couple of weeks, they're still contacting me for lots of different projects. So it could be a DIY, it could be traveling to Sydney to do something with my kids. Um, and then, you know, it's been a genuine relationship with them. Um, and in turn, I actually bought a Ford Cougar as well. So, you know, I'm still, it's a genuine relationship and um, a great friendship with them so they know that they can call me anytime for a, a PR thing that they might have coming up and I'm always willing to look at it and go with it. And when would be the line for you? So when would you actually say no Ford I can't necessarily do that or yes I'm willing to do that? How do you weigh well, that up? Well, I actually think they know me quite well now because that relationship has been going on for such a long period of time. Uh, they won't offer me anything now, which is great that I wouldn't be interested in doing. But of course, you know, if it was something that wasn't quite right, I'll, I'd just gently say, you know, that might not be right for my blog at this time and give them a reason. And um, yeah, and, and they're not funny about it. And, and so, okay. Yanni, is that true in your case? When you're choosing bloggers, are you happier if the blogger explains what they will and won't do up front? Absolutely. Knowing the limitations of, of what the blogger is willing to write about, knowing how comfortable they are with subject matter that their blog isn't, isn't, um, isn't common context, um, it's, it's great to know the limitations from the very beginning. I mean, most of the bloggers we work with have pretty clear passion points that they're interested in. They've got a good content cadence, and they're talking about certain things across the uh, across their blog. Um, so it's really good to know at the beginning what you are willing to talk about and what you're not. Okay, so tell me about um, your audience and how you will integrate sponsors' content in a way that's right for the audience rather than for the sponsor. So talk to me a little bit about yeah, how that's sure. worked for you. Um, I think I found, I was saying earlier, my blog's very um, consumer-based. So it seems to be a lot of people want to come to my blog to see um, what to buy and where to go and what looks great. And I, and I do a lot of um, interior design, a lot of homewares, and a lot of things to do with the family. So it's all inside your house and things you'd be doing with your family. So, you know, it has to be based around those areas. Is. It has to be very lifestyle based and it has to suit me and my lifestyle. And, you know, I have kids and I'm busy and things. So I, I need to make sure it definitely will sit with my audience yeah. and be believable. And so, Yanni, talk to me about bloggers and lucrative deals with bloggers. How is blogger outreach currently working and what could a blogger expect to earn from a decent brand campaign these days? 
So it, it, it does vary brand to brand. I think that you know most of the organizations that we're supporting, if they've made the decision that an online influencer program is part of their advertising mix, are certainly willing to invest in, in, in working with us to ensure that content resonates well. Um, you know, in terms of a dollar figure, it, it does vary quite wildly. Uh, and I think, you know, depending on whether it's a big multinational brand or whether it's a local brand, you know, it is, it, it is, it is a pretty big difference between what lucrative, uh, what would be considered lucrative, both from the brand's point of view and from the bloggers. Um, but I think that, you know, if, if, if you are cultivating your audience and you are creating genuine content on your blog, you know, brands have noticed and they've asked us as their agency to really think about, well, who can we partner with in a way that gets our message out there in an authentic way. So you also spoke to me about earned campaigns and the value exchange in an earned campaign versus perhaps a paid blogger campaign. Can you explain the difference between that and how you work it? Yeah, certainly. So from from social at Ogilvy standpoint, we adhere to a pretty strict uh, global ethics policy regarding how we engage with online influencers and bloggers. And it must be a true value exchange between the brand and that blogger. And typically that value exchange means you know getting advanced access to a product or getting backstage access if it's a, a, a concert or thinking about how you can get something that isn't available to the general public. And in exchange for that access, you will write a review of what that experience has meant to you and how you think it'll integrate with your audience. Um, we do work with brands and organizations that are willing to pay for, for coverage and to pay bloggers for their, their, their participation in a program. We just consider that to be part of your advertising spend. So it's, it's fine as long as you disclose that it's part of a paid program and it's part of a larger piece of work. Um, it's, it's completely fine. We just don't consider that to be earned media. And so Katrina, can you talk to me about the way brand campaigns have changed and relationships with bloggers? What sort of experiences have you managed to garner through your experience as a blogger? Yeah, I mean, I've had some little campaigns like a lot of the bloggers and I've had some really big ones. Um, so it can be just a product to product. They give me something and I'm happy to mention it. Um, it could be an attend a, an event. Um, um, but, uh, you know, we're always chasing the ones that will actually pay you a good, good fee and, and make it worthwhile. And I've done some really great ones recently. Um, I've done some great work with IKEA um, and that's been awesome for me and then also I've just partnered on with Annie Sloan Chalk Paint which is a big 12 month campaign so I'm actually gaining um, a good campaign with side by advertising and sponsorship for a paid fee. So we're seeing campaigns really change from just this whole notion of a sponsored post or a review to a more holistic yes. approach and Yanni can you talk to me about this whole idea of seeding content on in the ecosystem how do you guys measure that and how do you think bloggers genuinely manage to do it? Yeah, so content seeding is important from, from getting the reach standpoint. Uh, when we work with bloggers, we try to think through, well, what can we do before a campaign kicks off? Leveraging your past content, leveraging the brand to really begin to seed, you know, and, and, and put an inkling of what that next bit of, of campaign content is going to be. I mean, we work with firms that specialize in video seeding and can get, you know, particular video posts across multiple channels. Um, we work across, uh, you know, a wide variety of, of, of other content distribution networks as well. So we can actually try to amplify what your reach looks like. That's fantastic. And so tell me about the specifics of a, what a blogger could be offered these days to work with. So we've talked about many different campaigns. You two would each have experience of this. What types of things are coming across bloggers' desks? <laughs> um, so, 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 I mean, some of the campaigns that we have you know, running at the moment, we have access to to you know some of the latest technologies from Microsoft. Yep. So some of the hardware that you can have in your home. I mean, clearly some of the work that we've done with Ford across the past couple of, of, of months has been access to you know cars and vehicles that you can t drive around in, explore your surroundings, and then write about what that experience has been. Um, you know, we've worked with travel companies that can get you access and 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 trips. Um, so the, the, the sky's the limit in terms of how brands want to engage with, with bloggers. Um, it really depends on whether a brand is launching a brand new product, whether there's a brand new um, you know, market they're trying to penetrate and want to try to do from a geographic standpoint. So the, 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 there's a lot that you can do. And what about you, Katrina? Yeah. Tell me some of the more interesting campaigns you've perhaps participated in in the last 12 months. Yeah, um, I did a really great game campaign recently with Masters, and it was a two-part campaign, um, and it was paid 
plus um, product, but it was a DIY. So um, we had to do a before post of an area in my home and then we did an after. So my husband and I actually built floating shelves to put under a television and it was a whole process. We had to move a PowerPoint and do a whole lot of work to it, but it was all DIY and it was all thanks to Masters and it was a really great before and after post as and well. did that work for your audience? Absolutely worked for my audience because that's what my blog's about. It's back to the block and when I was on the block and it's all DIY and it's reno and, and it was easy to do and yeah, that worked great. So anything where we physically got to do it within our house works great on my blog. And so talk to me about the future of this, Yanni and Katrina. Where will we be in another year or two with these campaigns? Well, I think we'll begin to see we'll begin to see more people across a bigger distribution of platforms. I think you know, when we first started doing influencer programs, if someone had a big Twitter following and someone was big on Facebook, we knew that they would have an appropriate audience. Um, but now we see the brands asking us to really look outside the box and look at more niche networks um, and more niche platforms to see whether or not we have a good reach and an appropriate relevance. So we'll see more bloggers as, or more brands asking us to work across Twitter. We'll see more work across Instagram. We've had colleagues in other parts of the world ask us to do things specifically on Pinterest. So we'll see an explosion of people who have good influence on more platforms. And I think that from a blogger standpoint, it's just important that your own your own blog is actually cross-seeding content across those other platforms as well. So from your perspective, you'd say bloggers should be on as many social channels in an engaged and authentic way as possible? Absolutely. If it's in, and I think the, 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 the nail there is, is, is how engaged is it and how authentic is it. You know, if you take a piece of your blog content and just post it on Twitter and then also post it on Facebook and then stick a link to it on Instagram, you're not really helping yourself out. But if you can really begin to cultivate how you publish content on different channels, it absolutely helps us know that you're a credible voice and you actually have built an authentic and a, an empowered audience on more channels than one. And from a blogger perspective, yeah. which social media channels do you find effective? Yeah, obviously my blog is always the best place for rich content and that's um, always going to be the place where people come. But I always love, I still love Facebook and I am on Facebook a lot because it, everybody seems to be on Facebook so therefore they can quickly see what I'm updating. I can have a conversation and I can keep people engaged that way. But I also love Instagram. It's really visual for what my blog is. Um, I can show before and after photos of little projects that we're doing. Uh, you can also just sh yeah share pretty things. And that's what I, I talk about a lot on my blog. So I really love Facebook and Instagram. Okay. Well, thanks so much for coming in. Really appreciate your time, guys. It's been great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our guest presenters who have taken time out to share their knowledge and secrets. A massive thank you must go to the Voices of 2014 sponsor Ford for making today's event possible. We really hope you enjoyed the webinar. Don't forget to share your thoughts, learnings or questions by using hashtag Voices of 2014. See you online.